a former Chief Justice of the New Hampshire Supreme Court, the Honorable John Broderick, has been on a journey to end the stigma surrounding mental health following his son's long struggle with mental illness that went undiagnosed and unrecognized for years. When his son was just 13, he began suffering from anxiety and depression, conditions that sadly went unrecognized and which led to dire repercussions. As shared in his recent book, Back Roads and Highways, My Journey to Discovery on Mental Health, Broderick's mistakes in failing to identify and treat his son's challenges have inspired him to embark on a campaign to change the culture, stigma, and shame around mental illness that keeps people, that keeps too many people feeling alone and afraid to step out of the shadows. Now, as Senior Director of External Affairs to Dartmouth Health, the Honorable John Broderick is now on a mission to share his family's hard-won knowledge about mental health and to change the culture, stigma, and shame around mental illness. Please uh, give a warm welcome to the Honorable John Broderick. Thanks, thank you much. I'll say that. Thank you for coming to the second warmest building in Woodstock, Vermont. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. I am the least famous author in Woodstock <laughs> this weekend, but I may be the most committed author in Woodstock this weekend. Uh, Normally, I would stand down there, but they tell me if I do that, I'll disappear. So I'll stand up here. I'd rather be down at that level because I'm not here to give a lecture. I'm here to share some thoughts. Uh, I have had a lot of amazing professional opportunities in my lifetime, not the least of which was being Chief Justice of our Supreme Court in New Hampshire, Dean of the Law School at the University of New Hampshire. But the reason I'm in Woodstock today, the reason I wrote the book that I wrote, is to advance the most important work of my entire professional life, and I mean that. For the last eight years of my life, I've been traveling and speaking wherever I'm asked. Dartmouth Health has made that possible. Over that time, I have spoken almost 800 times. I've traveled 100,000 miles in northern New England. I've spoken many times in this state and beyond. I've spoken to over 100,000 kids live and in person. I've spoken to 40 or 50,000 adults about mental health awareness. It has so changed my life and it has made me impatient for change. Because we haven't, for generations, talked about mental health openly and without shame or stigma or shadows. You all know that. And nothing will change until we start doing that. And so people are willing to say, my mother, my father, my cousin, my brother, my child, myself, why would anything change? It's 2023. We don't have a mental health system in America. It used to be that way for cancer. My mother used to whisper the word cancer. Some people weren't as brave as my mother. They'd say, he or she has the C word. The only adult in my childhood who ever said the word breast publicly was you Hefner. It's true. No one said breast and no one said cancer. Now we say breast cancer. Look at the changes. Everyone in this hall today knows the color for breast cancer awareness. That's a good thing. If I said to you, do you know the color for mental health? A lot of people would say, you're kidding. It has a color. I didn't know that. That's the gap I'm talking about. So why am I on this mission? Why did I write the book? I'm the least likely person I know to be doing this work. If you had told me 30 years ago that this would be the last seven or eight years, 
of my professional life, I would have run screaming from the room. The most important work I've ever done. I'm a baby boomer, not that you ever could have guessed that. And in my childhood and for most of my adult life, no one ever talked about mental health, no one. Must have been too awkward to talk about it, so nobody did. I was so ignorant about mental illness, I didn't see it years ago when it took up residence in my own house, in my 13-year-old son. He thought it was just him, and we didn't see it for what it was. He was suffering, but we didn't see it. He was a really talented artist as a kid, and he spent a lot of time in his bedroom drawing, sometimes with the door closed. Today, I would describe it as withdrawing, but I was pretty ignorant about mental health back then. I'm not ignorant now, by the way. I'm not ignorant now. When my son graduated from the eighth grade, he told us that morning he didn't want to go to his graduation. And we thought, well, it's summer, he doesn't want to be bothered anymore. That wasn't why, but he went. He wasn't happy about it. There were probably signs of his mental health problems in high school, but we were so ignorant we didn't see them. And if we saw them, we wouldn't have known what they meant. He graduated from high school. He's really smart. I mean, genuinely smart. His grades were never as good as his potential, but he always tested well. He went to a good school in New York. And he started drinking pretty heavily. That was kind of shocking to us. He graduated from college. He went and got a master's degree in Boston. His drinking got worse over time, but he got his degree. And then he came home. He was living with us. It didn't take him long to get a job because he is really smart, really talented, handsome, funny. I mean, he's got every skill you need to be successful, but the job only lasted six months. It wasn't his fault. He said he lost the job. The next job took longer and lasted for less time. It wasn't his fault. He said he lost the job. And finally, my wife and I reached out to the alcohol experts because we were so concerned about his drinking, and they were too, by the way. And they told us what we needed to do, what we needed to learn, and maybe what choices we'd have to make. And we followed their advice, and it was disastrous for my family. I'm sure their advice was well-intended, but it turned out to be wrong. Up to that point, by the way, no friend, no neighbor, no family member, no colleague, and sadly, not my wife and I ever said, I wonder if he could have a mental health problem. They told us, the alcohol people, that at some point we'd have to decide to put my son out of the house or let him stay in the house where he would die drinking, they told us. Not tomorrow or next month, but said you can't drink like he's drinking and have a long life. And we didn't like those choices. And so we persuaded my son, who didn't have a drinking problem, to go to alcohol rehab. It was like the world tour of alcohol rehab. New Hampshire, Connecticut, Cape Cod. Finally, he went to Florida. Nothing took. Nothing took. And finally, my wife and I reached a point where we had to decide, as they told us we would, and we loved our son, as you might imagine. And we made the hardest decision we ever made in our lifetime to put him out, literally out of our house. It was the hardest decision we ever made. It was the worst decision we ever could have made. He slept in his car. He slept at the shelter. He ate at the soup kitchen. When he was eating, he continued to drink. And after three weeks of that agony, we brought him home. We didn't want that phone call that no parent wants. And when he came home, nothing had changed. He was still drinking. And looking back, I think he was probably scared to death that we would put him out again, and he knew he just couldn't go out again. And so one night when he was drinking, he assaulted me. I have no memory of that, but that's what happened. 
I went to the ICU of a local hospital. I was in the ICU for six or eight days. I don't know how my wife survived it. I don't know how he survived it. I was on the Supreme Court of my state at the time, so I drew a lot of press. They wrote about it in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times. My doctors went on the Today Show when I was in the ICU. I, I didn't know that. My master's educated, decent, funny son was arraigned in a public courtroom before a lot of press in Manchester and issued an orange jumpsuit and went to the Valley Street Jail. My wife visited him twice a week. The first time they met, she said he was wearing a jumpsuit. They spoke on a telephone with plexiglass between them. She said he was really upset. He said, Mama's dad okay? I can't believe I did that to dad. Just tell me he's going to be okay. I never forgive myself. In the early days, she didn't know. I, I don't know how she survived all that. After six or eight days, I remember being wheeled down to my hospital room. It was on the top floor. It was a big room. And by the way, just a thought. When you go and visit them at the hospital, try not to say to them, I love your room. Don't, don't say those things. <laughs> People told me that I hated my room. <laughs> After two days, my wife and I were finally alone. I still wasn't able to get out of bed. And she told me what had happened as best she knew, and, and I hadn't fallen like I thought. And she told me where my son was, and we just cried. I've been a judge and lawyer my whole life by that point, so I knew what it meant for him, for us, even for his younger brother. If I had any understanding at all, it would have been alcohol when it's abused can take people to bad places. I don't know the dictionary definition for hopelessness, but I know what hopelessness feels like. That's exactly what it feels like. When I got out of the hospital, I wasn't allowed to visit my son. The court wouldn't allow it. So I didn't see him for six months. The next time I saw him, it was in a windowless basement courtroom in Manchester where he was taken from the jail so he could be sentenced to the state prison. Hope you don't have that day in your life. I would have bet you anything I ever did or owned or might ever do or own that could never be my family. It was on that morning. Still a lot of press. It was still a story to somebody. He came in that day. My wife and I were in the first row, and I stood up. Came over, hugged us both, and held me back. He said, Dad, I am so sorry. Just tell me you're going to be okay. I said, they tell me I'm going to be fine. I said to him that morning before he was sentenced, if you don't quit, your mother and I won't quit. He said, I won't quit, Dad. I wasn't sure I believed that, but that's what I told him. And then he was sentenced to seven and a half to 15 years in the state prison. I don't know how we all didn't pass out. I don't know how he didn't pass out. He'd served six months, so he wouldn't serve that twice. The court suspended four of the seven. He was going away for at least three years. And then off he went. All over the news. They don't allow you to visit new inmates for 30 days. They find out what their issues are, where they should house them on the prison campus. But after that time, we went up. We met with the head psychiatrist, two social workers. My son had to allow it. He was there, my wife and I. A psychiatrist started the meeting out by saying, I've come to know your son, Judge, since he arrived here. I really like him. He's really funny. He's smart. He's really gifted. I thought that was an odd way to start the meeting. I said, no, we love our son, doctor, but we're in the prison here. He said, I know where we are. Let me tell you what's going on with your son. He has really serious depression. He has anxiety and panic attacks, that feeling you're about to die. That the psychiatrist said were virtually off the charts. He said he was self-medicating, judge, with alcohol. That's what that's about. It was the only relief he got, judge. Don't get me wrong, he said, it wasn't a good choice, but it made sense. The problem is, after a while, the more you drink, the more depressed, the more you drink, the more depressed. It's a black hole. 
And so we're going to try to deal with his mental health problems, Judge, and turn his life around. This baby boomer on that day knew when he told us that, that we had failed him. I was, after all, the parent. I should have known something about mental health. I thought all mental illness, by the way, was hopeless. It's far from hopeless. I know that now. I didn't on that morning. We would visit twice a week. I was on the Supreme Court at the time. You might imagine I wasn't really popular at the state prison. I was worried for my son's safety. He was very brave about it. After four months, he came out one night, hugged us as he always did. He said, Dad, I feel so different. I said, what do you mean different? He said, I'm sleeping through the night, Dad. My mind's not racing all day long. I can focus, Dad. I'm teaching at the prison now. I said, what are they doing for you? He said, well, I see a counselor here, Dad. She's terrific. And I take medication at night and in the morning. I didn't know you could feel like this, Dad. I knew we had failed him. I should have known something. You don't want to find it out in the state prison. He was like that for the balance of his time. He was up for parole after three years. I was chief justice then. I said, you deserve it, but you won't get it. It looks like they're favoring the judge's son. He was parole. And that day they sent a camera up from Channel 9 in New Hampshire, put it two feet from my face and said, do you have anything you want to say? I said, I do, actually. We're really happy my son will be leaving and coming back to everyday life. But I want to tell you something else, too. My son's not a bad person who's now suddenly a good person. He's always been a good person. He's now well. And those are very different things, by the way. He was supposed to be on parole for years. After a year, the parole officer said, I'm going to try to eliminate your parole. I really enjoy visiting you once a month. Something wrong with that picture. My son was excited about it. I said, they won't do that. They should, but they won't and they eliminated his parole. I love my son. My son, who was drinking for years every day, has not had a drop of alcohol in 19 years. He said, Dad, I'm not that guy anymore. I don't feel like that guy I used to feel. But I'm a baby boomer, so I didn't want to talk about it. But people talk to me it came up to me that first year in grocery stores and pharmacy counters, gas pumps. It didn't matter. They recognized the face from the newspaper and they'd say, hey, Judge, you're looking good. I knew what they meant. I said, thanks, I'm feeling better and my son is doing so much better. Oh, I didn't want to ask. I said, that's okay. We, we saw alcohol only. That really wasn't his problem. It was mental health. And then all of those people who were strangers to me, Every single one of them would then say to me, my mother, my father, my brother, my best friend, my cousin, myself. I heard about all manner of mental health problems, from anxiety to depression to bipolar disorder to schizoaffective disorder. I heard about suicides, suicide attempts. I said to my, my wife, we thought we were alone down there in the Valley of Mental Illness. A lot of families down there. I had never looked up. I've looked up now. I have looked up now. But I wouldn't have known what to do until eight years ago, I got a call from a psychologist in New Hampshire. He said, hey, John, I have a good friend. She's a psychologist in Maryland. She wants to start a national mental health awareness campaign. She wants people to know the five basic signs of mental illness, like most of us now know the signs for a heart attack or a stroke. We didn't always, by the way. We do now, which is a good thing. I thought that was genius. I got involved in the campaign. It has largely consumed the last eight years of my life. We had to raise money for the campaign. I was dean of the law school, so I know what raising money is supposed to feel like. This didn't feel like raising money. Everyone who gave me money had a mental health story somewhere. We launched this campaign on a Monday morning, May 23rd, 2016, in the empty house chamber at our state house in Concord, 
400 seats in there, 400 state reps. They weren't in session. The speaker said, John, you can use the chamber. So I thought, who's going to show up on a work day at 10 a.m.? I said, this will fail before it starts. My wife and I got there that morning. There were 425 people there. It was the single most impressive room I had seen assembled in my 40 years in New Hampshire. Every member of our congressional delegation, our then Governor Maggie Hassan, three members of the Supreme Court, the Attorney General, law enforcement, educators, CEOs, the Catholic Bishop, the Episcopal Church, the Jewish community, and families. I knew he had hit a, hit a nerve that morning. Barbara Van Dalen, the genius behind the five signs, she was on Time Magazine's 100 list in 2012. She was there that morning. She asked this question of the most impressive room I've ever seen assembled. If there's anyone in this chamber, she said, who has a mental health problem or knows somebody with a mental health problem, would you raise your hand? I didn't know. Every hand went up. Every hand went up. I said to her after a barber, how is that possible? She said, John, it happens in almost every room where I ask the question. I know she's right now. I gave a TED Talk last month at the Music Hall in Portsmouth. There were 950 people, they told me, in that auditorium. I have never asked that question in all the years that I've traveled and talked in my entire life, but I'm so impatient for change. I said to that group in the music hall, if you, someone you know, or someone you love has a mental health problem, would you please stand up? Every single person stood up. What are we doing? We don't have a mental health system in this country. After that launch at the State House, we waited to see if anyone would ask us to speak anywhere. We didn't know how to do this. No one had ever done it. So we waited to see if we'd be invited anywhere. In the last eight years of my life, I've spoken at over 350 middle schools and high schools all around New England, mostly northern New England. Spoke at multiple times in Vermont. It doesn't matter where you go, by the way. It doesn't matter the age of the people you're speaking to. It's a topic that's long overdue. I wish you could be with me on those days in those rooms when the oldest person that's ever spoken to them, probably, I'm the grandfather they've never met. And I say to these kids, I tell them my family story, by the way. I don't sugarcoat it. When you're vulnerable in front of children, they return the favor. They open up. It has so opened my eyes. When you hug kids who were in the sixth grade who persuade you in that moment that they're going to kill themselves, I always make sure they're talking to someone before I leave. I've talked to more kids who are anxious and depressed in the last seven years than anybody alive. Not because I'm special, but because I'm present for those kids. This generation, by the way, I love these kids. I mean, they are smarter than I ever was. They're more worldly wise than I remember being at their age, and they are the least judgmental generation of Americans in the history of our country. Anxiety and depression are epidemic among young people. What are we doing about that? The Center for Disease Control issues surveys every two years to high schools. Seventy high schools in my state answered the survey in 2019, before COVID. 2019, looking back to 2018, I'm sure a lot of high schools in Vermont answer it too. It's anonymous. You don't tell them your name. You just tell them your sex, your age, and your year in school. In that 2019 survey before COVID, 46.6% of high school girls in America were depressed. 26% of high school boys. 
The question isn't, are you depressed or not? The question is, have you been sad or hopeless for two consecutive weeks or longer in the last 12 months so that you weren't able to engage in normal everyday activity? Can you imagine if 46% of high school girls had any other illness? It'd be a national crisis. In fact, it is a national crisis. The Surgeon General of the United States a few years ago said what was going on with America's youth on mental health was a national crisis. The American Academy of Pediatrics described it as a national emergency. In that 2019 survey, 25% of girls in American high schools had given serious consideration, that's the question, to ending their own lives in the previous 12 months. 15% had made plans to kill themselves. 11.3% had attempted suicide one or more times. 2021, the suicide attempt went to 13.4%. The depression rate among high school girls went to 56%. Half the kids I see, half the kids I hug are getting help nowhere. What are we doing about it? And so that I don't seem too righteous here, I'm probably the last person in this hall that can be righteous about mental health. I failed my own son, but I'm a lot smarter now. I'm a whole lot smarter now. The purpose of my book is because I'm trying to reach parents and grandparents. Early in my travels, kids don't have a choice, by the way, when you go to a high school, or middle school, or whatever it is, they have to show up. So they're kind of a captive audience, but they don't have to listen, but they listen. Not me, by the way, I know that. It's this topic. You don't see a cell phone, they lock in. One girl came up to me recently, seventh grader, two weeks ago, she said, you made me so happy today. I said, really, what did I do? She said, to have someone your age talking as openly as you do about mental health makes me feel happy. She said, I have mental health problems. People in my family do too, but no one ever talks about it. Out of the mouths of young people, they want to talk about it to parents that don't. Early along, I'd go to high schools and the principal would say, please come back in the evening and talk to the parents. So I thought that was a great opportunity. One night we got 150 parents, which was the greatest number of parents I'd seen. The high school had 1,800 kids. Oftentimes it's 30 parents or 40 parents at a high school of 13 or 1,400 kids. I've had confided conversations with thousands of young people in gyms and auditoriums I'll never go back to. It so impacted me. I don't have a right to have a fiduciary obligation of these kids, I know that, but I feel it. The only reason that I've been allowed to do this, the only reason Dartmouth published my book, is because I was Chief Justice of our Supreme Court. They got me into schools, they got me into auditoriums like this. Not about me, it's about this topic. And so the book, Backroads and Highways, which I wrote during COVID, I wrote it selfishly in a way. I wanted to get it out of me. I've just talked too many kids with wet eyes and cracking voices. I don't want it just to die with me. I want people to feel what I felt, see and hear what I saw and heard. But mostly I want people to start talking about it, normalizing it, demythologizing it. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Every time I read about a suicide, I think, what are we doing? We're sending grief counselors, we're sending flowers, which is nice, but it's not sufficient. 
one in five adolescents in the United States, one in five, will have a mental health problem. Most of them are treatable. Evidence-based treatment works. One in five adults, by the way. You can do the math. It's tens of millions of people. 1.4 million lawyers in America. I'm a lawyer. Even I think that may be enough. 675,000 CPAs in America. 28,000 psychiatrists. That's 335 million people. If I could fix it myself, I would. I wouldn't have to bother anyone. I wouldn't have to travel 100,000 miles. But I can't. We could, if you want to help. Or we can pretend it's not a problem, or it's not our family, or it's not our town. Most of the kids and most of the adults, by the way, with a mental health problem, are not going to do themselves harm. But they're not going to have a very fulfilling life if they're anxious and depressed. It doesn't need to be that way. It doesn't need to be that way. If you go to high schools and middle schools like I do, and you talk to the school counselors, you say, are you busy here? You're busy from 8.30 to 3.30 every single day. I went early along to one of the best prep schools in the United States. You'd know the name if I gave it to you. I spoke to the entire student body just since I've spoken to you here today. And the senior boy who introduced me got up and asked his classmates, if you or someone you love has a mental health problem, he said, these are the best and the brightest. If you or someone you love has a mental health problem, would you please stand up, he said. It was early in the campaign. I thought, probably nobody will stand up. Not here, not now. After about 30 seconds, hundreds of kids were standing up. And when the standing stopped, only about 25 kids remained in their seats. It's, it's hiding in plain sight. I told that story of that boy's question to a public high school on the seacoast of New Hampshire about six months later. I wasn't asking them. I just told them the question that boy asked. And before I could tell them what happened, the kids at that middle-class high school started standing up. Almost every single kid was standing up. The principal came over to me and said, I'm shocked by this. I said, I'm not. <laughs> not anymore. Concerned, yes. Shocked, no. In any event, I wanted to write the book so that others, if they were interested, could see and feel what I have. And the second part of the book, as modest as it is, is what do I think it is? What, what's causing a lot of this problem? And to be very honest about it, there are a lot of reasons for adolescent mental health problems, from adverse childhood experiences to trauma of all kinds, to genetics, to chemical imbalance, to the social determinants of health, I know that. But having done what no one else in America has ever done, spoken at 350 schools, talked and hugged thousands of kids who can find, a lot of what's happening with anxiety and depression, which is epidemic, I believe is caused by societal and cultural forces. This generation of young people, by the way, as great as they are, and they are, by the way, they're the first generation in America to grow up, literally grow up, in a 24-7, high-speed, high-volume, multitasking, high-achieving, alone-together virtual world. A lot of those days when I'm driving back on these roads in New England, I'm thinking, how is my middle-class childhood so different than the confided childhoods I'm hearing about. And after seven years, I think I know. I think I do know, actually. It's not the answer to every problem, but it's the answer to a lot of them. We have fundamentally 
change childhood in the United States. We are over-organizing, over-competing, over-scheduling, over-structuring kids. I don't know about your childhood, but my childhood benefited from the inefficient use of time. It was called play when I was growing up. Do you remember play? I don't know what ever happened to play in America. It's gone away. If you see kids now, they've got a uniform, a coach, a travel team. What are we doing? I learned independence, self-reliance, self-image. I experienced failure and disappointment as a kid. It's okay. I was bored a lot of the time in the summer. Boredom isn't the worst thing in the world. It generates creativity and imagination. I spoke to two high school athletes one night. They were varsity athletes in a very upper middle class town in New Jersey. Very bright. They played hockey. One was president of the senior class. I described my high school years, which had some responsibilities, obviously, but had a lot of free time. And when I finished, I said to him, can you relate to that? He said, I can't relate to a single thing you just said. He said, I'm in the gym every day at 5.30. I shut my light out at 11 o'clock. Every hour of my day is scheduled. His friend was even more honest. He said, I don't think I ever had a childhood. I did. You did, too. I was at a school one night in Maine, or one day in Maine, and this girl that I'm going to describe waited 40 minutes to tell me what I'm going to tell you. She was so sad. She said, I'm in all advanced placement classes here at the high school. I study every night until 1130. I have no life. Was that your junior year in high school? It wasn't mine. I said, why are you doing that? She said, to please my parents. I said, I'm sure your parents love you very much. Have you told your parents what you've told me? Perfect stranger. She said, no. I said, I think you should. She didn't answer. She just hugged me, this girl, and ran down the hallway. She never told them. I wish you'd been with me a couple of years ago. I spoke behind a school on Nantucket Island. It was early November. It was a beautiful day. 60 degrees, no clouds. I was speaking to kids fifth grade through eighth grade. Do you remember those years? I do. I asked them this question. If I could promise all of you an 89 on your next test, you wouldn't have to study anymore. You get an 89. You pick the subject. Or you can study all night long before the test, and I'll give you a 90. How many of you would study all night long? I said, raise your hand. Every single hand went up. Social, cultural stress for achievement and success. Do you realize kids are spending four to eight hours a day looking down at a screen, sometimes after midnight? Adults are almost as bad, by the way. Social emotional growth comes eyeball to eyeball. That's where it comes from. It doesn't come down here. I see it everywhere I go. We can change it if we want. If all of us could take our foot off the gas just a bit and allow kids to figure out who they are, what they're good at, what they want to do, support it to be sure, encourage them to be sure. I became a lawyer, not because my parents said, you should be a lawyer, but because I watched Perry Mason on television. That's why. We didn't know any lawyers in my town and my family. My mother didn't say, that's ridiculous. She said, well, that would be interesting. That's why I became a lawyer. Today, I'd be building a resume starting in the seventh grade. It's coming from a loving place, I get that. Parents love their children as much as any generation, but we are overstressing them, over-organizing them. We're defeating childhood and the growth it provides. I see it everywhere I go. Do you know in high school today, probably do it in Vermont at a lot of schools, any grade you get on any day is posted on a platform 
every grade, homework assignment, test grade, quiz grade, so your parents can access it. That wasn't your life. I said one night to a young man who told me that story, I said, how do you survive the 65 on the quiz you weren't expecting? Well, it goes on the platform. My dad knows about it before I do. He said, what did you do? I said, well, thank God we didn't have a platform. And my memory is when I got those grades, I don't think they made it home. I think they got stuck in my book. But I knew the report card was coming. So I had a few weeks or eight weeks, whatever it was, to bring it up. I had to be responsible or the mean judged every day on my latest homework assignment. That's what I'm talking about. In any event, I appreciate your attention and listening to me. Uh, this has become the most important work I've ever done. And I can't fix it, but we quit. Anyway, yes, thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, at this point, we'll take some questions from the audience for a brief period. Anybody have any questions? Nobody. Bueller? Oh, hold on a second. I'll come right back to you. And if you don't mind uh, just stating your name, standing up, and uh, addressing the question clearly, that'd be awesome. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm Anika. Um, I was wondering, you talked a lot about, like, they're not being a system for mental health. Are there any policies you've seen? Let me stop. Let me come down. I'm having trouble hearing. Oh, so sorry. Let me, let me come down. If you, if you want to bring that microphone right up to your mouth right there. Sure. There you <laughs> go. Is better? Uh, I was wondering, are there any policies you've seen that are like at the community level or higher that are effective in addressing some of the things you're talking about, like access to services? The, the short answer to your question is no. Uh, there are curriculums in schools now. So every kid in high school usually takes a health class. The problems I'm talking about are not curriculum fixed. They're family focused. They're community based. Um, I'm a big fan of public schools. And public schools are doing as much as anybody on earth to deal with mental health and students. But they're only there seven and a half or eight hours a day. 16 hours a day, there's someone else looking after them or not looking after them. You go to most schools and they limit you in school on the amount of hours you can spend on your iPhone. They have no control about that when you go home. They have no control over whether your parents especially get all A's or achieve great success. Those are cultural, social issues that we need to deal with as a community. Uh, I read, by the way, I felt badly for these kids, as proud as I'm sure their parents were. I read the bios of the top 10 students at a high school in New Hampshire recently. They published them in the paper. I was sorry for the kid who finished 11th. He didn't get a bio. But the ten, top 10 students did. Every one of those kids had a better bio than I do at my age. Oh my God, they're in nine honor societies, four clubs, three varsity sports, four travel teams. What is that? I spoke at a high school graduation in New Hampshire a couple of years ago because I wanted to see what that was like. I hadn't been to one since my kids graduated. The good news is they, they haven't changed. The bad news is they haven't changed. And the number one student in the class is a young woman I called on her, she came up. She was brilliant. You knew that when she spoke. She was 17 years old and she was in good health. When I saw her come up the stairs, I thought, have you been outside in the last four years? She was the palest person you could imagine. She wasn't unwell. And so she spoke brilliantly, I would say. When I was leaving in the recessional later, 
she was at the very end with her mother and father, and I stopped and I said, congratulations, that's quite an honor. And she thanked me, and she said, thanks for speaking here. And I said, what are you doing next year? She's 17. She said, I have an eight-year scholarship. I'd never heard of that. So I said, are you going to repeat college twice? What is that? I, I don't know. <laughs> she said, no, no, I have a four-year scholarship to college and a four-year scholarship to medical school. Maybe when she's 20, she'll say, I don't think I want to be a doctor. Well, I don't think I want to stay at this school for eight years. She's brilliant. What is the rush? It's almost like we have to grab that brass ring, leave nothing to chance, commit now. I, I don't understand it. And so, whatever the policies are, we don't have a mental health system in this country. One thing we could do, we could start paying psychiatrists so there wouldn't be private pay. The reason most psychiatrists are private pay, unlike your, your family doctor, is they don't get reimbursed very well. We don't incentivize people to go into mental health, and we don't pay them when they're in there, and we don't reimburse them when they arrive. It's not because people wouldn't do that work. We don't throw a lot of federal funding into mental health, and mental health medications, and mental health counseling. And we never will, by the way. If it were that easy, it already would have been fixed. No one's going to fix it unless we insist on it. Policymakers are going to say, that's too much money. It's really not. We spend a lot of money on failure in this country when it comes to mental health because we don't have off-ramps. The largest providers of mental health services in America, 2023, are jails and prisons. Does that make any sense? It's about 55 to 75,000 a year to have someone in jail. Some of those folks, if you were, if you were having a mental health system, they'd be treated when they were 13 or 14 or 15. We're very good about bullying everyone. We know what a bully looks like, he or she. We're good at behavior, but we're not good at saying, why is that happening? Why is she doing that? Maybe a mental health problem there. So we're not very inquisitive about what's going on. And if we are, we don't have any place to send them. I talk to school counselors all the time. They want to refer out. Hard to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry. Um, we have got this young lady right over here. And uh, this will young be the last lady? question after that. That's Thank you for that. Uh, certainly not a young lady. Um, this is not my question, but I, I just had a thought listening to you just a moment ago. Maybe we wouldn't have the uh, homeless issue we're facing in this country if we had a mental health uh, uh, solution. Did you hear the question? Maybe we wouldn't have the homeless issue if we had mental health in America. A lot of folks on the street have mental health problems. They are homeless, but that's all we see. And for years, certainly, the baby boomer crowd that was like a personal choice or a character flaw. If you were a better person, you wouldn't be homeless. If you were more ambitious, you wouldn't be homeless. Well, that may be true in a limited number of cases, but it's not the problem. Uh, and so we need to invest in that. Or we could just keep moving the homeless population off to downtown, pretend we've solved the problem. San Francisco has a huge homeless problem. Really, what they have is a huge mental health problem. I mean, that's what it is. Uh, a lot of the drug issues in this country, how many people do you know of who are happy, healthy, well-adjusted, and successful who are shooting up and overdosing? I don't know any of those people. But there are a lot of people who feel left out, left behind, and they have mental health problems. It's their alcohol. It's a drug problem, but it's not only a drug problem. Why are we unwilling to call it out for what it is? Because if we do that, then we'll have to do something about it. And not a lot of people want to do that. Uh, we could save so many lives. And I don't just mean from suicide or overdoses. I mean people whose lives are not going to be what they could be. 
It's not a head cold. Anxiety and depression is not a head cold. It doesn't get better by having hot soup and some rest. It's with you your whole life unless somebody deals with it. And as long as we are stigmatizing it and shaming people, we've come a ways, but we're not where we need to be. And I've taught so many kids who are self-stigmatizing. We've taught them that. I've had kids say, I'm so ashamed of my mental health problem. That's on all of us, by the way. And um, Judge? From all of us. Um, I'm sorry, that, uh, that was sort of a comment on my part. My actual question for you is, I'm ashamed to say I don't know what the five signs of me mental illness are. Can you tell us? I can. <laughs> uh, I have cars up here, too. The first sign is not feeling like yourself or someone you know is just kind of not themselves. You know that. I don't mean you're out of sorts for a day. It's just not feeling yourself. Or you are, second sign is you're easily agitated. And you didn't used to be that way, but now you're agitated. You're withdrawing from life. I don't mean you're shy. Shy is not a mental health problem. Withdraw My son was withdrawing. I didn't see it then. I see it now. The fourth sign is your hygiene is changing. You used to kind of take some pride in your parents or your friend did, and they, they don't now. There's usually a reason for that. And the last sign is hopelessness. I don't mean sadness. Sadness is a part of everyday life. We're all sad from time to time. I mean hopeless. There are other signs. Those are the most common. And when I spoke to the head of psychiatry at Dartmouth Health, I showed him the five signs cards. I've given out 500,000 of them, by the way. My goal was to have one on every refrigerator in New Hampshire. Now my goal is to have them on every refrigerator in America. I said, are those a good composite? He said, yeah, those are a good composite. It'd be hard to have a mental health problem and not have one or more of those signs. We need to start sharing that with young people. We need to share it with older people. Not just young people that have mental health problems. A lot of seniors have mental health problems, and some of that is worse after COVID. Like, as my wife says to me from time to time, usually not in a complimentary way, she'll say, I think it's time we put our big boy pants on. I think so, too. I think so, too. What are we doing in the Woodstock community for mental health? You know, there's a book I'm going to recommend. I didn't write it. Mimi Beard wrote it. I saw it in the bookstore today. Uh -huh. It's called He Wanted the Moon. Have you heard of that book? Yes. Yeah. You should buy it. It's about her father, who was a graduate of Harvard Medical School, uh -huh. who developed acute mental health problems after he became a physician. He devoted much of his professional life to trying to figure out what was causing his problem. He was hospitalized against his own will many times. But the impressive thing about the book is her father wrote the book. She got it some years after he died. It came on that kind of tissue paper. So you're reading his experience from his own mouth. Thank you, Judge. Um, we're going to have to just move along the last couple of minutes here because we have to wrap up. This gentleman right here had a final question. Yeah, my name is Steve Shama from Woodstock. Uh, talking about refrigerators, for while we were raising our children, we had a card on a refrigerator, and we actually still have it. You are your child's greatest source of self-esteem. Right? And I'm noticing every time you were talking up there about, and I give them a hug. And, you know, to be loved, inherently loved for who you are, not for what you do, is something very, very basic in life. And all of us need appreciation, but it's deeper than that. You are, we love you. We, and, and it's not what you say, it's but where it's coming from. I agree with it. Um, and the other thing is that we're still doing the kinds of things you're talking about. Uh, in elementary school, you get awards for what you do, not for who you are. In, 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 in high school, you get awards for who you are. And in fact, the way we introduce speakers over here, uh, without being critical, is who this guy or gal is, as opposed to 
He's a great dad. He communi- he, he's a great empathetic speaker. He cares about people. We, we don't value those things. And in my uh, profession, before I retired, they would spend five minutes of a 15-minute talk talking about what this guy or gal did, his curriculum CV, you know, curriculum vitae. And then he would be introduced, and he would be talking about who knows what. And I'm saying, but where is the guy in this? Where is the gal in this? That's what I connect with. And so we're still doing it, and we have to stop it. We are doing it. And these kids today, by the way, this is not my phrase. I wish I had come up with it. The phrase is outcome fever. Kids are driven to achieve certain outcomes. Uh, if you graduate from high school today with a 3.8 on a four-point scale, the, the sense is that's the goal. You have achieved it. Your life is fine. It may be, but not because of your GPA. In all the years I was a trial lawyer, I did it for 22 years. I was a judge for 15. I was a law school dean for four or five years. No one in all those years ever said to me, hey, John, how did you do in high school? No one ever asked. No one even asked me where I went to college, where I went to law school, how I did in law school. Because if I won their case for them, I wrote a decision they respected. I was a great lawyer. I was a great judge. If I had lost their case when I was trying cases, and because I screwed up, and I said, but you don't understand. I know I lost your case, but have you seen my transcript? <laughs> I don't care about your transcript. You're a lousy lawyer. That translation, when my wife was teaching school, she's a student teacher, she, she did this later in life, she said at the end of the year they had a contest for all these grade school kids out back of the school, whatever the specific race was they were in. She was supposed to give out four first place prizes for the same race. What, is second place too devastating in life? Seriously, I, these kids are not being prepared to fail. They are scared to death of failure because I hear it all the time. Kids are not growing emotionally because mom and dad want them to be the perfect child, the achieving child. When I gave that TED talk, and believe me, I said I don't want to be righteous because I'm the last person that can be righteous on this topic. I said, you should see the child in front of you not the child you hope is in front of you. Ladies and gentlemen. It's the same. That's your point. Who is that person? Anyway, I've kept you too long. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Judge Broderick. It's 112 degrees in here, so thank you for coming. <laughs>